Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. We're now bringing together our panel. I'd like to introduce to you Dirk Carson Beck, uh, founder of Rebus, founder of High Lesson Ventures, and the chair of White Hat 2016, who will lead our next panel. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. I can't take credit for founding Arevis, though. I, I was one of the founders. Um, some of our technology came out of Fraunhofer Institute years and years ago. Um, and it was one of those situations where there were these great engineers who created this amazing solution for a problem that didn't exist at the time. And uh, when there was a problem, that's when we became interested. And uh, so our imaging technology deals with really, really big image data. And we've gone through a couple acquisitions. Um, we haven't exited Arevis yet, um, and are not really looking to do that quite yet. Uh, but so I, I really want to be able to, to talk about the after the exit uh, and what happens. And so we've collected a great panel here. Uh, we've had a last minute change um, to the, the, the panel. And um, so we're going to have Matt Likens uh, jump in. And thanks so much, Matt, for, for doing that. And sorry to do that to you. But um, I'll let every one of uh, the panelists give a quick uh, overview of yourselves and um, maybe just a brief uh, synopsis of the of the exit that we're talking about uh, good afternoon thanks for uh, joining us and we'll try to make it fun and informative my name's Jock Holloman I have been a general partner for Valley Ventures for many years uh, a resident Phoenix Arizona fund and uh, I started in the venture business in 1982 with a privately held SBIC in Oklahoma. And in 1985, I came out to Phoenix to run the venture group for Valley National Bank, now J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, in 1993, I took the portfolio private in a secondary transaction with some institutional capital and have raised three additional funds totaling just under a hundred million. So we've done a lot of Arizona work, probably 70 deals in my career, and probably uh, 32 exits, uh, IPO, acquisition. Uh, the rest of the 70 didn't make it to exit because we do early stage deals, but uh, the exits are a lot of fun and look forward to talking to you about them today. Go in order. My name is David Mallory. Can you hear me? Um, I, uh, I'm here at one of the first exits I did, and I see like probably 10 people in this room that were actually affiliated in one way or another with the company, uh, including the Flynn Foundation, which was an investor, and then Snell and Wilmer, and David Wilson, who joined post acquisition, I think, but um, uh, helped build the Molecular Profiling Institute, which we sold to Keras Life Sciences at the end of 2007 when I was 37. Uh, and we sold it for 5x from our first round of fin financing 36 months later. And um, I stuck around at Keras for a year or so, and then I went on to do my public service for the National Cancer Institute. We did the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, and then uh, I was crazy enough to go back in and try to build a better mousetrap and uh, helping uh, find therapeutics to treat late stage cancer. Uh, my name is Matt Likens. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, thank you. Um, started my career with Johnson & Johnson for just a few years and then uh, Baxter Healthcare for over 20 years in blood collection, transfusion medicine, dialysis, immunotherapy, hemophilia, kind of across the board. Uh, was uh, eventually president of Biotech North America, which was the transfusion and plasma fractionation business and hemophilia business. And then ended my career there in 2001 as president of uh, the dialysis business in North America. Um, went to a startup in South Florida where I learned everything not to do in a startup, very valuable, five years of experience, and then came out here in 06 uh, to be CEO of Ulthera. Um, our founder was Michael Slayton, uh, still is. 
located in Mesa. Uh, Michael was convinced at that time that we were 90 days away from FDA clearance because they had already sent in a 510K and a little over three years later we got FDA clearance. So I uh, love the regulatory agencies if we have any FDA people here. Uh, but we got on the market in Europe and Asia in 08 with a focused ultrasound device uh, that deposited focal thermal energy at three different depths below the surface of the skin and led to neocollagenesis, building new collagen that created firming, tightening, and lifting of skin tissue. Um, and uh, um, filed to go public, as Joan had mentioned earlier, in January of 2014. Uh, and then in our third amendment to the S-1 document, there were three companies that uh, looked over our 300-page document and were interested in us. And we ended up selling to Mertz Pharmaceuticals out of Frankfurt, Germany, uh, in July of uh, of 2014, I signed a two-year retention agreement, and I have some definite views on what to do <laughs> after the exit, uh, after that experience. So, thanks. Great. Thank you. So, obviously, there are a lot of people here who are looking to raise money and build a venture, and, and I think naturally you think about what happens after I exit. What do I, what do, I do? How do I best do it? I mean, everyone thinks, okay, let's go do this, build it up quickly and sell it. But there are so many things that happen along the way to make that happen. Maybe um, give a quick overview of, you know, the greatest uh, impact or, um, you know, on the company personally to your employees during the, the exit process. I don't know if who wants to take that. Yeah, so if, if I can start it, I, I think um, as I'm advising some companies now, uh, I make it a point to um, encourage them to stay open-minded about what the exit is. Because I think you may actually be more attractive as a company if, you know, if you're not in an early stage saying, hey, I can't wait to sell and already talking about the exit, the exit, the exit. So we always built it for the long term so that any exit or monetization opportunity would be open to us, whether it was going public, whether it was being acquired, whether it was staying private because we had managed significant profitability over the first four years of commercialization. So all of those were open to us and I think that made us a more attractive acquisition candidate as a result of that. Um, so the impact to the employees, I guess, certainly more job security because we were venture backed, uh, losing money uh, to being bought by a very you know successful company certainly helped. But it went from more of kind of a garage band to a band with like a one hit wonder, and it was a little, you know obviously a lot more corporate, and um, and so I think it was a hard transition. We um, we gave a lot of our actually all of our employees stock, so I think they were okay with the exit. Um, but certainly it, um, the culture changed a lot, but then uh, they, you know, they successfully went from a small lab in downtown Phoenix to a 60,000 square foot facility uh, down by the airport and it's still growing today. I, I think that um, exits are driven by your shareholder content and uh, many companies are bootstrapped and proprietor founders and founding management teams own all the company. Um, then there's the venture-backed group and, and the blend of ownership between institutions and founders, founding management. And sometimes you have a corporate investor. Um, so I, I think the exit strategy uh, is largely driven by your shareholder base. The venture investors typically like a five-year turn and they are going to push you and position you for a five-year turn and keep you on a five-year path, knowing all the while that uh, in most life science business models it takes twice as long and twice as much money and it might be seven to ten years, but they keep the pressure on you for sure. So I, I you know, I just, I think uh, uh, as you capitalize your company, uh, think through your personal goals uh, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, uh, as to whether you want a, a long run or a short run. The VCs are looking for companies that have rocket ship potential and they put the fuel in. So uh, the, the, the shareholder base, I think, is an important consideration. 
Yeah, and I, I would want to second um, what Matt said. We, you know, we work with a lot of pharma companies. We have over 150 clients at, at Arevis, and um, we get told all the time, well, especially with the early stage ones, well, we're, we don't need to do that because we're going to sell at stage, you know, at our phase two, and 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 it's like putting major systems in that that uh, help organize uh, the the company. Uh, oftentimes, they just say, oh, our CRO is going to do that. Well. It makes it a lot harder for a, a, you know, especially in the pharma world, to just get, you know, ingested into the the new entity if you don't have all of that in place uh, or on your premises. So, um, so the next question is really about uh, personally. Um, how can you personally prepare uh, for an exit? I mean, there's there's getting ready, the company ready, and getting your team ready, but it's always lonely at the top. And and any thoughts on personally preparing uh, for an exit? Um, well, it, we were having a small conversation right before, and there's sort of two camps. One is we worked a lot with Ameripath when they sold to Quest for like 1.2 billion, and the CEO literally put everything in, from his desk into a crate at the end of the, uh, once it was signed, and put it in his trunk and just left. And then there's other entrepreneurs such as myself that, you know, can't let go and, and really, you know, want to, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And um, so, you know, I guess, the feelings about the exit, you know, there's certainly the success that you have, but also a lot of the folks that are entrepreneurs and building companies do it because that's sort of what they do. Um, but there is, uh, you know, you know, in hindsight, transitioning sooner might have been better for my mental health and not building what's now one of my larger competitors. But it's just, you know, uh, there's two camps there, and I don't know what's the right answer. I, I think that, uh, as, as David said, the CEO is a lonely position, and depending upon your board, um, you can either rely on and, and confide in certain board members or you can't. And I, I think trying to get some board members who can um, help you uh, navigate not only the the valuation and structure, uh, but the emotional and people content as you move through the the process. Um, there are there are good exits and there are bad exits, and the good exits are the ones that everybody talks about. Um, the bad exits uh, people tend to brush under the table. So I'll give credit to Bill Miller, one of our our buddies. We were talking last night about. Uh, and I'll throw out a bad exit, a, an entrepreneur founder sells his company, his or her company, and uh, doesn't have necessarily uh, insight into uh, the implications of the reps and warranties that he or she makes to the buyer. And uh, the escrow retention is probably a big number big percentage and plays out over a couple of years, then uh, there can be some surprises that negatively impact uh, whether or not uh, there was enough money made in the deal by the founder uh, to really uh, consider it a success. So it, good legal advice, I think, is another important part, um, and there's no shortage of that here in Phoenix. Yeah, I think it's an emotional challenge to prepare oneself for the end of what was, uh, because I think uh, you become so involved with the growth of the company. I was a second employee, and we grew to 220 employees at the time that we uh, that we were acquired. Um, and the good news was that every full-time employee had equity ownership in the company, and so. Uh, and as these three companies began their bidding process, and we got to a level that was 6.6 .6 times trailing 12 months revenues, uh, which was uh, you know significantly better than I think the average in a medical device uh, type of uh, transaction, we felt very good that we were getting appropriate value for what we had done over that period of time. But I don't think there's any way to fully emotionally prepare for the fact that you're no longer in charge. You know, the board, of course, was in charge, but you know they made me think I was in charge, and uh, 
uh, when you're acquired by a German pharmaceutical company, they make it clear. <laughs> they make it clear in case you had any doubt. You know, it, it was their name on the check. Um, yeah, and so and this may be stepping too far, but but uh, myself and the rest of the senior management team agreed to a two-year retention agreement, which seemed to, well, that, that's two years to emotionally prepare for the departure from the company. And that ended on June 30th of this year. And I would say that was probably about uh, 18 months too long. Uh, because any transition shouldn't take longer than six months. Beyond that, you know, it's uh, uh, it's it's probably way beyond the point where you're still useful. Uh, so that's I, I would uh, opt as a CEO for a shorter transition period and make sure that you just work harder if there's a lot more to do and make it six months or less. Uh, move on with life, and I think everybody's better off. Yeah, picking, picking up on that, uh, I had the honor to be chairman of a large architectural engineering company based in Minneapolis. Uh, not exactly a life science deal. Uh, and this company designed uh, Chase Field and the basketball arena and uh, did all the work for Mayo Clinic uh, across the country. They were hospital and sports. And it was time to sell um, 430 employees and um, we hired a banker, entered a process, William Blair out of Chicago. And the company, after some uh, gamesmanship, which we played artfully, uh, was sold for 60 some odd million dollars, a little over 1x revenue, which was good for that, that industry space. Um, this is a professional services business, and so uh, everybody, uh, the, the assets get on the elevator every night, and um, there were a lot of uh, retention and employment agreements extended to the key people. And uh, when, when three years passed, I, I called the, the CEO, and he had just served his last week, and literally all but two or three of the key people had gone because of the cultural change. And they'd migrated back into smaller emerging uh, architectural and engineering firms. Uh, so not surprising, but entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs and they cycle around uh, and do the same thing over and over again. And I, I would um, suggest that most of you in this audience being at this conference are probably not uh, looking for large corporate positions. All right, so hindsight being 2020, in each of your deals, what, what would you have done differently? You guys did it all right, 100% the first time, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not very introspective. You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of looking forward rather than looking back. But uh, just to reiterate, I think uh, I would not have been uh, lured into staying for the two years, and so I think that's the only regret. Uh, you know, as one gets further along on life's path, it seems like every year becomes a little more important. And so, in those two years, I couldn't go to conferences like this and understand the emerging technologies across a lot of different therapeutic areas that are very, uh, very exciting. So I feel like uh, you know I'm making up for lost time now. So I, uh, in the future, on my next successful startup, <laughs> uh, I, won't, I won't do that again. Yeah, I, I've just got a fine point. Uh, I'm in the middle of selling uh, one of the last of the Valley Ventures portfolio companies right now. And um, it, 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 we didn't quite hit the liquidation preference on the preferred with the purchase price. But the CEO and chief science officer and several members of the team uh, held this company together in some difficult markets. And um, a couple of the board members, myself included, led a charge to do an ad hoc carve out for the management team. So we're taking money out of the institutional pocket and putting it into the pockets of the people who did the work. And, and so but you don't hear that every day. But, um, we, I shared with the CEO the carve out and the specific methodology and the amount, and it was a, it was a good number, several million dollars. And uh, the buyer wanted to know the exit compensation for all of the, every employee in the company. 
And I advise the CEO not to share that with the buyer because my feeling is that every penny that we put in management's pockets, the buyer will take out if the buyer knows what this team is getting. And I just, you know, I, I think you wanna, you wanna conduct two very separate negotiations. So don't tell your buyer what your carve out or what your exit compensation is and negotiate the best deal you can because uh, uh, non-competes, uh, that's another subject. You can take longer term compensation uh, in the form of a non-compete or a consult. Uh, you know, get your options vested, any, anything open on the way out the door, clean the slate because uh, it's a different ball game when a big company takes over. Um, I think two things I probably would have done different. One was something that I can't just change about myself, but just being a paranoid entrepreneur that someone else is going to come and eat our lunch. And, you know, in hindsight, I realized how far ahead we actually were with our product and test. And, and so you're always worried that the new, you know, genomic platform is going to come and recommend drugs faster, cheaper, or better. Um, but, you know, it, it, there is a evolution. And so that's part of what kind of drove us to an acquisition. And then the good advice that, um, that I got in the process was get as much cash as you can up front as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, so we did that. And then the, the acquiring company then gave some of the leadership and, and most of the team stock to stick around also. So they did actually want us to stick around. But um, trying to avoid milestone payments unless you're absolutely certain that uh, you could get there, you know, not holding the steering wheel. Well, and you lose control at that point. Right. So making the milestones isn't really in your in your control. Um, so maybe a simple question, but how? What's next? I think that's what what everyone wants to see is, you know, what's next? How are you? You know, you you worked so hard to to get to a certain point. How are you giving back to the community that uh, that you built your businesses in? And uh, you know, maybe a little bit about. Um, what do you get to do now that you couldn't do before? Um, I'm, I'm not a company builder per se and will defer to my colleagues, but I, I've seen a lot of, of entrepreneurs deal with that issue. And uh, they invariably, the, the people that, that I've invested in have been congenital uh, pathological entrepreneurs and they go right back at it as soon as the night competes over. <laughs> is, that, is that a compliment? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a compliment. So, uh, pathological is a compliment, Jack says, so thank you. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I take a lot of uh, 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 pleasure in helping to place folks who I have been working with for the last uh, eight years or so into new roles because we had a very talented team. I think there, uh, fortunately, the economy is growing here. There are lots of opportunities, and we have great folks who can fit well into other corporations. Um, I also uh, feel like uh, over the course of you know a lot of years in Fortune 500 corporations, and then the failed startup, and then a successful one. There are a lot of lessons learned, and so I've been trying to interface with a lot of uh, earlier stage management teams who may not have been through the wars as much and share those lessons learned so that they don't make the same mistakes uh, I made and maybe shorten their cycle time to a monetization event or whatever's right for their company. So I'm really looking to support uh, uh, entrepreneurial companies in, uh, in moving forward maybe in a more efficient way based upon these lessons learned. I waited super long. I waited 10 days to do the next company after the non-compete was over. <laughs> so that was a very relaxing 10 days. But um, no, we, uh, you know, I think while we're incubating the current company we're doing, we, we leveraged a lot of federal uh, research money and did a large uh, federal grant. And it's nice to try to keep the burn rate low. And so um, really just going back and doing it again, we leveraged a about $30 million on my next venture from the University of Michigan, which they've now allowed us to spin back out as a more competitive late stage cancer test. So I'm pitching my current company. It's Paradigm <laughs> Diagnostics. We're raising the B round. So um, we just, uh, we're consolidated on Fifth and Van Buren and that's what I'm doing next. So. <laughs>
Uh, Dirk, if, if, if it's okay, just uh, raise another subject. There, there are a lot of different types of exits. And just to mention a few, um, the standard classic acquisition, and it can be an, uh, a change of control, can be an asset acquisition, uh, or it can be a stock purchase. And there are a lot of nuances between those two. And so again, seek good legal advice. Um, and to David's point, get as much money as you can up front and avoid the performance earnouts. And the, the, the IPO is, is what is the, the brass ring everybody strives for. But it's got its pitfalls too, particularly with small companies. And I look at IPOs not as a liquidity event, but as a capitalization event. And a whole new game starts and a whole new paradigm starts in terms of management, fiduciary, shareholder responsibility, registration, reporting requirements, etc. And um, so I, I, I've seen a lot of companies who did the penny stock IPO and the stock bopped up to a couple of bucks a share and then they didn't hit their numbers, they lost analyst coverage and it became a penny stock. And I. I I've, I've lived that myself. So um, don't think that the IPO is the panacea. And there's a third uh, uh, exit uh, avenue that I'd like to, to mention. Um, big device, big pharma, big diagnostic, uh, licensing deals. And this is a very special arena requiring really good legal expertise. And the licensing deal, standard in pharma, will be an upfront payment for the license and then milestones for clinical uh, progress, uh, regulatory approvals, and then some sales bonus numbers when you begin to hit revenue that are just straight tied to dollars, uh, cumulative sales, and then you get into royalties as well. So the, the, that is a very complex field and um, sometimes you'll, you'll get the upfront payment and the pharma will decide not to develop the drug. And so it sits for a long time, the IP portfolio gets older, uh, the molecule and its reputation is tarnished because the big pharma decided not to develop it. You finally get it back and all you've gotten are the upfront dollars instead of the back end payments. So there, there's just an awful lot of um, care that needs to be given to that licensing uh, formula. No, that's, thank you for that. That's great. Um, you know, a little bit to the, the whole idea of uh, starting the next venture, right? We're, if you're operating a business, you're always having new ideas, but, you know, we have to maintain focus. And so I can see how there's just these, these ideas that you want to move forward with and it, you know, probably doesn't take more than 10 days to, to jump with that new, new ability to fund a project uh, into the next one. So. Um, any closing thoughts? I think that's really all uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, if not, I think we, we are. We did start late, so we can give everyone uh, the opportunity to go back to the, uh, the presentations. Which, uh, good luck and build great companies. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay.